Hello, hello, hello. This is Dan Drago, and welcome to 25 O'Clock. Thanks for being here. Thanks for checking in bi-weekly for uh, another great conversation with an awesome person. In depth, we really sit down, we really get it done here at 25 O'Clock. Anyway, uh, this week on the show is Jennifer McMillan from White Pines Theater Group up in Elkins Park, uh, which is uh, north of Philadelphia. Uh, more on her in just a minute. I just want to update you on the life and times of myself here at 25 o'clock. It's been busy. It's been crazy uh, the last few weeks. Uh, I've started a school semester, still working, and still trying to give you guys an awesome, awesome podcast every couple of weeks. Just got back from traveling up to Rochester, New York. Actually, just got back this evening. Um, it's Monday. You're going to hear this Tuesday night or Wednesday. Uh, I had to jump ahead because of the class schedule. Um, but, uh, it, it's all the same. As long as nothing really pertinent happens between Monday evening and Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, I think we're all going to be okay. Right? Right. Excellent. Anyway, I just got back from Rochester, New York, went up there for my father's 60th birthday, which was awesome. It was full of, uh, full of surprises for him, which meant a lot of, you know, lies and not, being honest about where we were, where we were going, and things like that, but it all worked out really awesome. Saw tons of people. He seemed to enjoy himself, so uh, I consider that a a trip well made. And I just had a great time kicking around Rochester, New York, which is where I'm from originally. I don't get back as much as I'd like to, and this was a good trip because I really did get a chance to check out uh, a lot of old places that I used to hang out in and uh, a lot of new places that I've never checked out before. Headed out. On uh, the Sunday, one of the last full days we were there, and uh, hit up uh, the Bop Shop, which is an awesome used vinyl store. Uh, Used to be uh, in a different place. Uh, They moved. I hadn't seen their new place. It was great. Dropped some coin on some awesome, awesome vinyl. Uh, Headed over to the Record Archive, which is a staple of Rochester, New York. Uh, And anyone from Rochester, New York definitely remembers the... uh, the commercials and the jingles and the dude in the giant record suit singing, uh, the record archive is the place to go. It's still as awesome as it ever was. Uh, I swear they have a new location there on East Avenue. I swear they used to be closer to East Avenue. Um, but that was cool. I uh, checked out a brand new bar in Rochester, New York called Knox Cocktail, started by a good friend of mine named James Black. Really great cocktails, really great food. You should really, uh, really check it out if you're in the Rochester area, or if you find yourself through the Rochester, ah, through the Rochester area. Oh, the driving it takes it out of you. You can't speak. Anyway, it was a great time to hang out in Rochester. Um, there's always cool stuff there. It's really cool to go back to your hometown and find all this cool stuff that wasn't there when you were there, but uh, is making your your home city cool. Uh, anyway, let's talk about the show real quick. Uh, before we get into it, before we talk to Jennifer McMillan, um, she is the artistic director at White Pines Theater, which is up in Elpen, uh, up in, oh gosh, we're going to start that over, everyone. Jennifer McMillan is the artistic director at White Pines Theater up in Elkins Park, which is just a little north of the city of Philadelphia. Um, and they're a very, very cool theater group up there, and it's gorgeous up there. We talk about the area up there in, in the show. Uh, she is very cool. She was very charming, uh, had a great attitude, and uh, a really great artistic sense of risk. And I've really come to prize that as I get older, um, making my own thing, watching my friends and people I know uh, make make artistic things, be it songs or um, movies or pictures or writing. Uh, I like to see more of a sense of risk. Um, she runs an improv group up there called Bright Invention, and uh, before you roll your eyes, uh, like I usually do every time someone mentions uh, improv or improv comedy, um, it's not just a uh, like a laugh a minute improv comedy troupe. Uh, they're going for some real engagement. They're really attempting to uh, improvise uh, scenes of all kinds, humorous, non-humorous, regular things, uh, poignant things, sad things, happy things. Uh, and I think that's a huge artistic risk right there. So uh, 
I'm really into that, and we talk about that a whole lot. Uh, we talk about a lot of things, so I'm going to stop telling you what we're going to talk about. We're going to go right to it. So here it is, my conversation with Jennifer McMillan of White Pines Theater, of the Bright Invention Improv Troupe. Here it is right here on 25 o'clock. Check it out. <laughs> So often, houses just like, oh, you know, we buy the house, we flip the house, and then we move on. I'm like, if I'm going to put that much work into it, like, I'm, I'm going to live there. Right. But, I mean, think about what you've spent in rent yeah. in the last 10 years, you know, or so, just living here. Yeah. Mm. No, I've, 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 I've done the math. It's, this, is not, this is not new information. Because <laughs> you, you, you've had the house over, how long have you had the house over, uh, over at 18th? Three years now. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the neighborhood's already come up, and... I mean, there's definitely work that needs to be done on it. The trick is to get something structurally sound. Yeah. That's like old lady central. It's just <laughs> ugly. That's why it's cheap. Yeah. But you can fix that. Paint, rip up the carpet. Yep. Take the, uh, take the wood paneling off the wood. Wood paneling, every, drop ceiling. Every house I look at in South Philadelphia is covered in wood paneling. Or Do you, you ever see look at the ones where it's like the entire living room wall is just mirrored? Mirrors. Oh, yep. God. And you just look at that. You're just like... Where in our history, where in our current modern history did we want to just like look at ourselves, watch TV? Oh, the shame. I, I saw one with terrible. an organ. I saw one with like an organ just right in the middle of the living room. Like it wasn't like just sitting there. Like it was built. Like they built the, the chassis for it, like to sit in the middle of the living room. Yeah, that's rough. The woman <laughs> I bought my house from actually said that when she bought the house for herself and her family, and she was almost 100 when I bought the house from her. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, she was 96 and she'd outlived her whole family which is why she was selling her house she had when she purchased the house she there was like big Italian columns uh, in mo- the living room marble columns yeah yeah and she <laughs> she said the first thing she did was take those out yeah. I mean how long, how long have you been in Philadelphia so I've been in Philadelphia since um, 2002 actually when I came here to study at the University of the Arts so you uh, so you started college in, in 02 yeah so that would make you 30. One. All right. Yeah, 31. All right. I graduated in 98, so I just, I did a little math right there. <laughs> Very well done. It's, I, I haven't had someone close to, it, it, with the exception of like my, my first guest, uh, I haven't had, everyone I've had on this show has been like in their mid-20s. Oh, uh, this will be so much more interesting. I just, and I, I, and I just want to throw out, I just want to throw, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to throw out a, I just want to throw out references. I'm like, you don't know what that is. Yeah, no. Mm-mm. <laughs> Like you, you, you never saw Usual Suspects, did you? <laughs> See, what a shame! What a waste! It's on. It's on Netflix. Yeah, right. So you came to Philly in '02. Where Where were you before Philly? So um, I'm from Boston originally. It's okay. interesting that you said your first guest was from the Boston area. He's, a, he's from. Uh, he's from Weymouth. Yeah. All right. So um, lived there until I was about seven, and then moved to the western part of the state. To the did Berkshires. you grow up like in in? Did you live like in Boston? In Boston, or lived in uh, pretty much in Boston. In Boston, my parents were both um, lived in the Fenway Park area. Oh, okay. Grew up there. Oh, and then yeah. I love it down there. It's awesome. But I I sort of grew up in the Berkshires in the western part of the state. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom moved us there when I was you know school age, um, and that's kind of where I consider home. That's where my mom still is. Mm-hmm. Is your dad still around, or no? Actually, he passed when I was seventeen. It's really, oh. it's it's sad, but it's also kind of a weird story. My parents were never married. Um, they were young, and um, they got pregnant, and that was me, haha. <laughs> and so figured like, oh, shoot, we should like fix this real fast. So they decided that they would get married, and my mom, I'll truncate this story for you. My mom said she would take care of everything. She just needed my dad to get uh, his tux. Uh, and a car for them, you know, to like drive off into the sunset in, uh, and that she would take care of everything else. And so she actually, they, they had no money. So she petitioned the city of Boston to allow them to get married in the Boston Commons Rose Gardens, which is very pretty. Mm-hmm. And my mom borrowed a wedding dress from a friend of hers. Um, and my mom was pretty, pretty pregnant at that point. So she like squeezed herself in there. And the day of the wedding, it, it poured. So the Rose Gardens turned to mud. And everyone was waiting outside in the rain for my dad to show up. And he wasn't there. And he wasn't there. And he wasn't there. And he wasn't there because the car he had uh, procured them to sort of ride off into the sunset in, he'd uh, procured from a company called Rent-A-Rec, which are cars that have been in yeah. major motor vehicle accidents. Yeah. It, it broke down on the highway on his way uh, to the wedding site. So he had to hitchhike to get there. Um, and when he finally did get there, apparently, my dad was a very tall gentleman. He was 6'3". Uh, six six four. He'd uh, he'd found us. He'd found a suit um, at the Goodwill, 
Um, it was like six inches too short <laughs> in both the <laughs> sleeves and the legs. Um, and he had flown his um, uncle, who was a pastor in Maine, uh, down to Massachusetts for the ceremony so that they could be married by family. And so got married in the mud and the rain and the sparred wedding dress and kind of late and everything was a little terrible, but they, they did it. They, they got married. And then a couple of weeks after the wedding ceremony, they got a letter from uh, cousin Nathan, the pastor from Maine saying basically like, Oh, J K L O L. I'm just, I'm only legal to do this in Maine. And the wedding was in Massachusetts. Whoops. So whoops. And by that point they were just like, nah, forget it. <laughs> eh, fuck it. Here we yeah, go. that was it. <laughs> So yeah, no, my dad actually passed when I was 17, but my parents weren't together, but he was um he was sort of an entrepreneur and a champion of me being involved in the arts and my mom um, still lives up in Massachusetts actually and she works at this fancy place called Canyon Ranch. Oh. It's where people like big big celebrities like Barbara Streisand come to stay when they stay in the Berkshires when they stay in the Berkshires the Berkshires are gorgeous yeah it's a really cool place actually to visit and it's awesome if you have a lot of money and it totally sucks bags of dick if you uh (laughs) grow up there (laughs) because there's nothing to do we used to go to the price chopper because it was open 24 7 like when i was a teenager what are we gonna do we're gonna go we're gonna get in our one friend's car and go to the price chopper in the middle of the night for us it was wegman's yeah 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 kind of lame you gotta have your and it's it's the price chopper where like half your graduating class all works Works. they all have a part-time job that'll scare you straight do you still i still have anxiety kind of when I go into the Wegmans in my hometown that I'm going to run into like people that like I used to know do you get that when you go to Price Chopper I you know <laughs> I have this sort of this is so embarrassing but I'm just gonna do it I'm gonna admit it I kind of hope to run into people because I'm one of the few people that like got out Are you one of the few who left? and I'm yeah, yeah like I left and I'm and I'm awesome because look I'm on <laughs> you, I'm on your show so it's like yeah go ahead and run into me I got lots to tell you wave about. around the podcast on an iPod <laughs> yeah right. an iPod that is no good anymore screaming in the middle of Price Chopper <laughs> do you know who I am do, do you, you know <laughs> who I am yeah I think you should definitely do that <laughs> <laughs> so when did you so when did you get into acting? I imagine in, in in high school or even before high school. Even before that, actually, it's and that's a funny story too. Um, when my mom and I and it ties into the Berkshires so nicely, it's like a great segue. Um, <laughs> we moved from Boston to the Berkshires and uh, we didn't know anyone, and it was total culture shock. We moved to this little. Um, oh, it was just you and your mom. Your, just your, your me father and my mom. wasn't there. Yeah, no, he wasn't there. So Where just, was he? Was he back in Boston? Yeah, he stayed in Boston, and um, she wanted me out of Boston public schools, so. When I was school aged, yeah. So, and the Berkshires are clean and safe and quiet, and the school systems are pretty okay. So, we moved out there, but the, the, we moved to this dead end um, on a lake, very pretty, but but no cars, no people, just nothing. There's nothing to do there. So, the first weekend we were there, my mom got the newspaper, and she was like, "All right, we're gonna figure out what there is to do in this new place, and meet some people, and have some fun." And there were three things in the "What's Doing" section for that day. One was an AA meeting. <laughs> One was a salamander search and find, which is exactly you what you think. You go and you search and find salamanders. salamanders. Do, you, do you get to keep them? I, you know, I don't, I don't know. Probably don't catch know, and release. There was, a third there was a third thing. There was a third thing. Which was auditions for a Christmas Carol. Oh, cool. At uh, Berkshire Public Theater. And so my mom, we just, we just defaulted to that because we didn't want to go to AA and we didn't want to search salamanders. <laughs> so so we, w- we went, we waited and waited and waited. I was the last kid to be seen. And by the time it was finally my turn, I was so nervous. I was begging my mom to take me home. But that was literally, we that was our whole plan for the day. So she was like, now you're doing this. Now you're doing it. <laughs> We're here. We're here. <laughs> yeah. So I did. I, had, I auditioned and I loved it. And um, I was cast in a very small role as the Victorian girl who actually starts the play by pulling the narrator on stage and saying, Daddy, Daddy, read me a story. And then he sits down and he opens the book and says, Marley was dead to begin with. Yes. That was my job. It was awesome. I actually almost failed out of the third grade because I was so into that. Because you were so into your 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 two line part. Pretty much. In the Christmas show. <laughs> Already blown off school. Yeah. Well, we'd get home, you know, from the theater at 11, 1130. I'd be all wound up. <laughs> then I was really tired in school the next morning. Oh, my I God. I couldn't care. I loved it. It was. I was totally bitten. It was like pretend but on a massive budget yeah it was the coolest so and that was when i started it was in 1993 okay and then i imagine you, middle school high school you did mu- you, all you, the you did the musical run and all that yeah i um i did all the things in in middle school were mostly like historic reenactments which were unfortunate because most of the uh main roles were for for dudes yeah but i it, i was undeterred and i totally booked paul revere 
um, as the lead in uh, what was that like uh, sixth or seventh grade and I just went in there with a lot of enthusiasm there were a whole bunch of kids waiting to audition for Paul Revere and I just went in there and I I yelled everything <laughs> and it scared the other kids off and I I got the part and then I did all the stuff in high school. I was captain of the mock trial team, mm-hmm. and I was on the academic decathlon team. I did speech and debate and all that kind of good stuff. So you were you were what the British would call a girly swat. <laughs> I've never heard of that before, it's, but yeah, all right. I really, really hope that it means what I think it means, which is just like like it, like an overachieving. Like yeah. I, I, I imagine you 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 got good grades. And... I was a selective learner. I still am. Oh. Like I, uh, oh man, I was such a weird kid in high school. I used to, I just embraced my eccentricities in my in my small town. To be popular, you needed to either play play soccer if you were a girl, mm-hmm. um, play football if you were a boy. I did none of those. And probably sports. have money too. That was money, probably <laughs> absolutely. And I was being raised by a single parent, and I was the last kid in my senior class taking the bus to school. They all had um, cars, nice yeah. cars. It would, you know. So yeah, I just embraced my eccentricity and um, shopped at the Goodwill and like really went for it. Like made pants out of terrible floral curtains and used to keep paintbrushes wrapped up in my hair and weird stuff like that. I went through a period of wearing a bindi. Oh yeah. Just you know because. The, the, the affectations we, we pick as uh, as teenagers. Mine was a scarf. I definitely had the scarf thing for a while. That's um, kind of hot, actually. And uh, and 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 the beret, but not not the French one. Like almost like like the Irish hat, like where it was. But but I wore it backwards. Oh. Um. For for brief. T- all the affectations. Um. So army army cargo pants. Yeah, I did um, that for a while because it, it was the late nineties. Yeah. Um. And everything was huge. Like pants were huge. Shirts were huge. Um, everything was huge. Everything was physically large. Dudes, yes. dudes with black eye makeup. I definitely, yeah. I definitely toyed around with that because of the music and all that. Um, played guitar. Oh, what, and, wow. and was in theater. Uh, and you were probably like one of the coolest theater. You were like the king of no the nerds. No way was no. I the king of anything oh. because I had a mouth on me, and I still, like, I still up until like I was probably in my mid-teens was like still kind of getting the crap kicked out of me because i just wouldn't i wasn't gonna i wasn't gonna leave it there yep you know how someone would be like dude that's enough just walk away i'm like no no not not gonna happen yeah (laughs) yeah i was totally i was that kid i i was well girls don't hit each other as much as guys hit each other i wasn't getting beaten up but girls can be super mean i think they can be worse than like i i i I see it happen with other with other girls i you know cousins and friends and friends who are teachers and all that and i see that and i'm just like i would almost i would prefer to get hit like than the kind of psychological power mind games that women in their teen years like to play with each other yep yep i i actually i mean i didn't I was a selective learner and I basically lived for my extracurricular activities in high school. Mm-hmm. So that's what kind of got me through the day. Yeah. And I loved English and I loved art and I was in chorus. And, mm, yep. and so was I. I was all these things. Yeah. Yeah. And then I just kind of skipped the things. I didn't physically skip them. I, I mentally and emotionally skipped the things that I, I wasn't interested in. I physically skipped some <laughs> of those things. It was, it was most important. You never skip theater and you never skip choir. Um, and towards the end, I had to stop skipping gym or else I was going to fail. Isn't that the most ridiculous thing that you can fail out of high school for like not going to pull up day or something oh, like yeah. that? So I actually concocted a really great um, scheme to get myself out of PE. One semester, I actually offered to write a paper instead. The gym teacher didn't go for that. I was like, I'll write you. I'll write you as many words as you want on, on the benefits of physical subject, education. Yeah. yeah, I don't care anything. No, because I was in gym class with like big hulking football players and all we ever did i don't know if this is a small town in the berkshires thing all we ever did in gym was play dodgeball like day after day i feel like that's the resort of a gym teacher that's given up (sighs) it it was it was terrifying like i don't know have them have them kill each other but not for real i used to get hit (laughs) in the face so this is really embarrassing Uh, for those of you just tuning in at home i'm i'm all grown up i'm like a swan now not an ugly duckling (laughs) you have to believe me on this but i used to get hit in the face so hard with that dodgeball in my in my high school years would pop my pimples oh god yeah, and then people would be laughing at me for getting hit in the face and for and having for like having pussy pimples. erupted pimples. Yeah, yeah, the worst. Because why not just why not just make it worse? <laughs> yeah, can you think of something more embarrassing? Oh, oh gosh, gross. oh god. Yeah, I really think that it's skill? it's some sort of sociological experiment, or the gym teacher is just a, is a sociopath and just sits there and just like, yes, run. <laughs> it was bite, gross. It was kill. gross. Yeah. But gym class is gross. Yeah, gym class is gross. I still get anxiety. Like, if I start thinking about, like, having to go in a locker room, like, 
at 15 like I, my, my heart will start racing yeah I'm, I, I'm an adult and I still in the back of my mind still think that someone someone would someone will kick my ass just for being me and I'm, I'm, I'm 34 years old <laughs> <laughs> and I I will still walk by like I will walk by teenagers sometimes like you'd be at the gallery or something like that and like oh. you'll see the teenagers hanging out and be like youths I'd, and I'll walk by and I'll be like be cool man be cool right or try <laughs> It's cool, man. Just don't, just don't let them know. And it's like they don't, we don't exist to them. No, nope, nope, I'm completely not out of their radar. Thank God. Yeah, but it's there's still. I don't think. I don't know when you ever feel like an adult. I don't know. I don't know when you ever don't feel like a teenager. I think it's frozen. I don't know if it was the same for our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation, but for us, I feel like almost everyone I know is still frozen in that late high school, maybe even early college mindset and we've grown up yeah. we've got mature and we bounce checkbooks and we have jobs and we own houses and yeah yeah gotten married and a lot of us have kids but like no i've yeah. asked all my friends like i have friends with like three kids and stuff like that jobs houses beautiful lives like put together like the freaking norman rockwell paintings and i want to ask them like do you feel like they don't feel like good god no man They're like i still feel like i'm 19 and we're driving around in cars like yelling out the window like yeah. that's what i still feel like yeah yeah i think too part of it i think part of being an artist also is is sort of um being really close to that awkward small yeah. person inside of you yeah because it's not accepted at least not at that being different's not accepted no as much as we'd like as much as it gets glorified in media now of like oh it's punk rock kids it's skateboarding kids like i hung out with the punk rock kids i hung out with the skateboard kids. we weren't cool Mm-mm. we were cool to ourselves but like no right. even even the coolest like most awesome punk rock kid like still worried about like the football players we're gonna we're going to shove them in a locker. Yeah. And, and these were guys that we looked up to. These were like upperclassmen and stuff like that. These guys we looked up to, like they had, they had tattoos, like they were, had pierced ears. They skateboarded, they smoked cigarettes, you know? And I'm like, I realized later, I'm like, no, those kids were also worried about like getting the crap kicked out of them too. Yeah. Yeah. In my, in my small town, I mean, our graduating class was uh, what, like 168 oh, or gosh. something. It's and you're just tiny. stuck with those 168 you're just stuck people, with them. whether you yeah. like them or not. Yep. Yep. And and then and then ten years down the line they call you and they say hey, we, we should all get together again and you're just like <laughs> I'm sorry who are you yeah. I just did my fifteen oh no um, I swore I I made a promise to or my to my a sixteen they, they they couldn't get together for fifteen so they got it for sixteen and it was small and it didn't work out too well I mean I I ran I ran into some cool people that I was like you know what? I haven't seen you in a while and we have Facebook now so it doesn't yeah even so you count. don't even need that right yeah. keep in touch with the people you want to keep in touch yeah. with yeah or I can at least you know. It's almost deity like. I can just like overlook the lives. I'm just like, oh, they had a kid. Yeah. And they bought a car. They went on vacation. Without actually having to be too yeah. involved or invested. I don't want to talk to you. Right. Is but I want to know what you're up to. Is your life better than mine? Yes. Good. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Harboring resentment. <sighs> I'll show them. <laughs> I'll make a podcast so great. Yes. <laughs> that, they'll, that they'll have to look at me. Now here we are. Making it awesome. Making it awesome. So you did high school theater. What made you... What made you want to go to, because uh, you went to University of Arts, right? I did, yeah. What made you want to go there? They're small. As I live here more, I realize how prestigious, like how prestigious they are kind of outside of Philadelphia. Like if you don't live here, U Arch is like a pretty. Yeah, it's growing. It's a pretty cool thing. But in Philly, I don't often think of it as like, like if you ask me list the major educational institutions of Philadelphia, I would get to them at the end if someone reminded me. Right. And I know you work there too. Like I'm, I'm yeah. not trying to put it down no, at all. I no, no, it's it's, it's a, a very small, bag. very specific. That's part of. So um, I ended up, you know, applying to theater schools because I, I honestly didn't feel like I was very good at anything else. And so I was like, well, I think I'm going to do that. I love it, and also it's something that I can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and my grades were okay, but I was selective. My SAT scores just like bottomed out on that. Yeah. Um, so a uh, lots of mainstream choices weren't really for me. I knew that. And I like the idea of being at a university that was all artists. Mm-hmm. There's no math majors. There's no communications majors. There's no football team. There's no Greek life. There's no, oh, yes. yeah. Right. I was like, finally, I'm going to go to this place. It's like Mecca and, and, like and be smack with Smack on the middle of, smack in the middle of the city, right on South Broad Street. Right in the middle. Yeah. And I wanted to be in a city. I knew that for cultural reasons and, um, I didn't know anything about Philadelphia. I'd never been to Philadelphia. The first time I came to Philadelphia was for my audition at the university. Um, Is it like a conservatory program? It is. It's it's a BFA. It's a conservatory program. Now, that might be changing in the years to come. Mm -hmm. They're under some new administration. But it's a conservatory program, so it's pretty intensive, which I really liked. Um, And you get really, really intensive training from industry professionals 
who are, you know, th th mm -hmm. working. I'm super familiar with it on the music side. I have mm -hmm. played and worked with so many musicians that came out of UArts, and you guys just churn them out. Like, yep. they're phenomenal. Like, every drummer, every bassist, every horn player, guitarist I've played with from UArts, I'm just like, whether, I l whether what they do is my thing or not, because there's a lot of jazz guys, because that's yeah. just... That's the program. That's jazz. the program. Um, and some vocal majors too and stuff like that. Um, but everyone's good. Yeah. Every, I mean, and, and not just like, not just like kind of good because you studied it for four years, like unique. They've honed their craft. Like they have a, to emerge at 22 out of an undergrad arts program and to have some semblance of a voice kind of blows my mind because I didn't have a voice at 22. I didn't know what, I didn't know what to say. Mm. I also, I mean, I wasn't in the music program, but like just as a player, I'd been playing a long time. I still didn't know what was going on the music program is totally mm -hmm. top notch you guys have phenomenal professors there great guys guys who i know like when someone says like my teacher blah, blah blah i'm like i know who that is like they're on this peter gabriel album they played with yeah they, they, you know like they, they played with stevie wonder they played the with teachers are, yeah. are the best part of the yeah. of the university so that's same sure. over in the acting side too it just the teachers. In, just it's yeah. in the acting analog it's yeah the teachers the teachers are absolutely the best asset that the university has going for them they're super passionate and they're all working professionals um as well as being theater educators which is pretty unique and the programming you know it's rigorous but you know to be honest there's they're tuition driven so well i mean aren't aren't all colleges now tuition driven they're you know they really you know they really need students mm -hmm. for sure um it's gotten a little bit less competitive i think in the in like maybe the last five years or so mm -hmm. we've been really pushed to take more students um there was a huge bubble maybe you heard about this but when american idol first sort of came on and those shows um that was like at the crest of that wave yeah uh there was tons and tons of applicants to the university of the arts everybody had suddenly had an artistic dream and wanted to go there and then that sort of ebbed a little bit mm -hmm. and now there are fewer applicants and it's become a little bit little less selective but i ended up going choosing the university of the arts because i i didn't actually have a lot of choices i was very naive going into the college audition process. I didn't come, my, my high school didn't have theater curriculum. We had a club, we had an after-school club run by a French teacher, which was great, it was fun, but I didn't have a coach. And the, you know, part of what I do now is that I do coaching for high school students who are getting ready to do these competitive auditions. And they are coming in, I'm making sure that they're either coming into me with or they are leaving me with a professional headshot and a resume that is appropriately formatted and audition appropriate material that is awesome and suits them and is two time and I'm giving them my choices and, and you know kind of coaching them up on it a little bit but when I was in high school I had no idea I didn't know yeah. my ass from my elbow and I went to my French teacher and I was like I need a monologue and so <laughs> he gave me one he was like well some other student of mine did this a couple of years ago and she got into college she so you you try it <laughs> it's the magic monologue yeah so what that's was what it? I did it was um from Eric Bogosian's Suburbia oh yeah that so guy that, that guy's guy. fun yeah and and it wasn't right for me at all as this sort of put together I didn't know, he wrote, I didn't know he wrote for a lot of women I never think of him as particularly right Women characters. There's one really great monologue in Suburbia. This okay. character named Suze, who's trying to get out of this small town, and the monologue is about her. She has a a retarded brother, a brother with Down syndrome, mm -hmm. who retarded's her word in the monologue. Um, th her brother Mikey has Down syndrome. He goes missing one winter, um, and they can't find him all winter long. And she and uh, eventually finds him in the spring when the ice on the pond melts. She finds his body. Oh, okay. So it's, it's really it's really beautiful and really moving and and uh, I didn't know how to act it so I was just very I think very honest about it and I think that's what actually got me. Well, that's in. good. Yeah, I didn't know how to adorn it. My other monologue was a Shakespearean piece from A Midsummer Night's Dream yeah. and I acted that all over the place and I don't think that helped. No, but they took you in. <laughs> they did. They took me in. They took me in. So you teach uh, you teach acting for non majors. I do. What is I mean, that's like the the art elective for like either like musicians or yep, people the in whole dance rest or of the university illustration. And you guys have a lot, animation. yeah. You, you guys have a lot of like uh, like graphic arts, like graphic arts, uh, visual design, jewelry mm -hmm. design, sculpture. Yeah, and some of them want to take an acting class. Yeah, and it's really actually I I teach the course for two reasons. One, because I love teaching acting for non majors, and two, I think because the more senior faculty don't want to touch it. Do you think there? Do you? Do you think you get more honesty out of these kids because they're not trying 
they're not trying to act like with hands in the air. Yeah, and yeah, like they that. don't come in with any bad actor habits, which is great, and or I mean, any preconceived ideas. They don't come in with ideas. any actor habits at all. At all, <laughs> right? So they're mostly blank slate. Some of them, actually, the challenge. One of the biggest challenges of that course, though, is that some of the students that I have, they're they're performers of a different kind. Maybe mm-hmm. they're musicians or dancers, and yeah. they did all that stuff in high school, and yeah. it was a toss up you know, what they were going to study in college. And so they actually do have some some chops and they're ready for a little bit more of an intensive experience. And then I have students who English is not their first language mm-hmm. or they, they, can't, they can't even speak in front of a group of people without bursting into tears. So that's one of the reasons why the more senior faculty don't really want to touch it because the challenge of... You it's know, a mixed bag. It's a yeah. hugely mixed bag. And getting them all to produce, you know, quality work but I, I really enjoy it and one of the things that I tell them on the first day of class is I don't, I'm not going to treat you like non-majors yeah we're, we're going at this we're here to learn it and and take it seriously mm-hmm. and that's what we're going to do and I think that my students produce work that's on on a caliber or on a level with with freshmen yeah acting majors and what do you think they do with this after they're done you know it's interesting I had one student this past semester that I just finished up he actually is uh, studies at USP the University of the Sciences um, apparently we have some exchange with them. He uh, was a pharmacy. This is, I don't know if this is really good news or bad news. He was a pharmacy major, mm-hmm. um, junior, um, on his way to probably a very lucrative pharmacy career. And he decided to take my class and he gave me a little bag the last day of class and had a box of chocolates in it and a thank you note. And he had written in the thank you note about how He'd broken it, finally broken it to his parents. He's um, he's Indian. Mm-hmm. That um, he loves acting, and because of my class, that's what he wants to do. So he's going to take time off from pharmacy oh, school. No. I know. What have you done? I've made monsters. He was going to be a yeah. highly successful Indian pharmacist. Yeah, totally. And oh gosh, <laughs> and and to send him out in the acting, there are not a lot of roles for that particular demographic no, right there. No. Oh, uh, what have you done? I don't know. I, yeah, so so it's kind of my teacher heart is very full. So some of them actually go on to want to work and want to get coffee with me and talk about how do I get an agent? How do I get started? Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of my students, my non-major students, have switched majors and become acting students. And the large majority of them think that they're going to get an easy A. So uh, they're yeah. there for something fun. and Yeah. Well, it's fun. It's good to have a class where you don't have to just sit and write and read books. Although I imagine you guys probably read some books. We um, Or you look at some text i assign them actually to i give them sh- really short readings i try to keep it really honestly fun because it is mm-hmm. an elective i assign them to go and see two theater productions either at the university or professional or anywhere um and write response papers so that they're practicing criticism you mm-hmm. know looking at something having some thoughts about it putting those thoughts down it also on paper. proves that they went yeah and it proves <laughs> that they went and most of them have never seen a play before sadly and so this this is forcing them out there. Well, it's not a unless you're like in a big city, like a big cultural center. I mean, like there's community theater and you might have gone to like to your high school plays when your high school put it on. But, yeah, most people don't see theater. I haven't. Once I got out of college, I stopped for the most part going to theater. And I have friends who are actors and things like that. But I couldn't tell you the last time I saw a play. Hmm. No, I really couldn't. Wow, <laughs> I wow. was really pulling it for a second. there. I, I think like, fr- well, I was in a French production. Uh, I was I was in a house band in a French production in 07 or 08. Uh, and a couple of years before that, when we first moved to the city, I was all about French arts because I knew what it was. What was the production? Was it Purple Rain? Oh, I wish. No, this was 07 or 08. I was in Zombie the Musical okay. at Plays and Players. Yeah. Um, I fell in love with the space. I think that space is fantastic. I think it's, uh, and I know you work out of there sometimes. I yep. think it's incredibly underutilized. Yep. Um, it's cool like i used to talk to them all the time I'm like you gotta get some bands in here i'm like I'm like get a good curated bill two three bands have it seated have it be like a proper show like going to the keswick or uh, the scottish Rite or the world cafe i'm like you could do well and I, everyone just looked at me blankly and i was like okay i'm like i i'm out of here next week i just thought i'd say something right right <laughs> i loved hanging out there i i, I loved the after hours bar upstairs quick <laughs> that was always fun that's a community hub for the, for theater artists yeah, especially yeah, yeah. How'd you get involved with plays and players? Um, I mean, aside from them being in Philadelphia and you being a theater person. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. How did it start exactly? Um, Daniel Student, the artistic director, is a friend of mine. Um, and, oh, I remember. Okay, it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> Flashback. Um, 
a friend of mine who I went to UArts with uh, gave me a call up in the summer um, and said, we're really, we need a favor. Um, we've had this actress in this one one track for this fringe show that's happening at Plays and Players drop out. And we've replaced that track three times. It was like the cursed role or whatever. Mm-hmm. They couldn't hold on to an actress to do this role. And um, it's a short musical. Musicals aren't really my thing. But I was going through this time period where I had promised myself I was in the year of yes. I was just going to like say yes to anything that came my way, especially if it really scared me. So I said I would do it. Um, and it was this really terrible. I actually thought I was going to need to like change my name and move out of town. <laughs> it was really, really bad musical about this short musical in an evening of four plays called Four Play, where all the plays were about sex. And this musical was about this guy, sort of 50s style, Grease style uh, musical about this guy who was in love with kitchen appliances. Really? Yeah. It is fringe. It is fringe. It was it was fringy. It was totally fringy. And it was terrible. And I thought, this is awful. And uh, we sold out the run. Everybody loved it. And people will stop me now. And that, that had to have been, I don't even know how long ago now, eight years ago, something like that. Yeah. And people will still stop me on the street and be like, I... You look familiar to Were me. You in the kitchen appliance rockabilly thing. Oh my god! Thing? It's the last <laughs> thing I ever think about. I'm like, oh, maybe you saw me at the in, in the interact show. Maybe you saw me in many of the hundreds of things that I thought were great. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, no. They will always remember. They'll always remember the thing that's weird. I don't know. Maybe it resonated with other people. Maybe you it, didn't. It, mm, okay. I don't, I don't know. know. Well, I don't know. There's it was no a long time accounting for I've taste. seen some stuff at Fringe that I still remember. That's Fringe. And so that's how <laughs> I got introduced to Plays and Players. And I made friends with some of the yeah. staff there. And they had me on for, you know, other other events and stuff. And yeah. I actually served on the board of directors there for a little bit oh, of cool. time. And yeah, it's a really awesome space. And I, I just finished, actually. Oh, so you just did a thing there. I just did a thing there. Yeah, I did a world premiere commission, actually, a one-woman children's theater piece written by a local playwright named Jeremy Gable and directed by um, this awesome director named Jack Tambori, who's a Yale MFA grad who just came to town. Um, it was cool. It was called um, Dream House, a Rainy Day Play. And we spent the summer workshopping it, sort of figuring out what it was going to be and writing it, Jack and Jeremy and I. Um, and then it went up for four, three and a half, four weeks this this past fall. Well received. Yeah, actually, um, un- the thing about children's theater in town, this is kind of unfortunate, is it's really hard to get coverage. Mm-hmm. You know, like arts coverage from the Inky or the City Paper. Yeah, they don't come out for children's theater. It's true because they they either either they have to. There's so much adult theater that it's you know it's hard to split your time. I think I think there's this idea that like or that it's not it's, legitimate. It's not legitimate it's, it's because not, it's, children's it's for theater. children. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's funny too. I I just had a guy on uh, who's uh, he's a songwriter and he's in a band. Uh, oh, he has a band, and he also does children's music. And he's he said the same thing. He's like, I don't understand why people delegitimize children's music. He says it's legit. He says in fact it's a much harder audience. Oh my God, I'd never done children's theater before, mm-hmm. and uh, this is a solo piece. It's just me up there. For 70 minutes. Um, wow. Yeah, it's very, it was very, very physical. There were puppets. There was a Shakespearean sword fight oh, wow. uh, between two puppets. Um, I had to play lots of different characters and different voices. And, and the house comes alive and talks through the toaster oven and the cabinets and the thing. You know, and there's lots of running around. And there's water effects where I go outside and I get wet and come back in all wet. Um, it was really, it was really physically demanding. It was very difficult, and I'd never, I'd never, and it was in a very small space. Mm-hmm. If you go to see children's theater at the Arden, um, a much, much larger venue, and yeah. so the actors get, they could probably hear noise. They can hear the kids sort of talking and moving around, but yeah. they probably can't hear the specifics of it. Where yeah. this was a fifty-seat black box, where the play invites some interaction with the kids in the beginning, and then kind of wants for the kids to then just sort of shut up. And let the play happen. Mm-hmm. Um, except and that they're kids. Except that they're kids. <laughs> they're kids. And it was really intense. Like the things that they would. This this one thing that happened to me actually. This was a really educational moment. There's a blackout in the play. Where the, there's a storm and the house loses power. And a good portion of the play is done in the dark. And we were prepared for kids to freak out about that. So we we told everybody with little kids coming in, you know, there's a blackout. And it wasn't the little kids. The little kids, they were there with their parents. They got scared. They just crawled into their parents' lap and they were fine. We had this school group come, like 40 third and fourth graders 
were like old enough not to be scared of the dark, but just wanted an opportunity to scream. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they were so outnumbered. There were like three teachers with them. <laughs> and so the blackout comes. The kids start to scream. And I'm, I'm expecting this to happen. And I figure it's just going to, there's going to be a crest of it. And then as soon as it sort of dies down, it's like holding for a laugh. I'm going to get in there with my next line. Except the longer I wait, the, the larger the screaming the gets. The more they just keep screaming. They just yeah. keep screaming. And it is pitch dark. There's not even any, you know, backlight or blue light. So now you're shit. scared? I, well, now I'm thinking <laughs> I've lost control of my show. And I don't know how to get this back. And so I think, all right, you know, teachers will clap, you know, to get kids' attention. But there were so many of them and only one of me. I had to bang on something. So I'm like, I'm going to bang on this toaster oven that's on the set. That big loud noise is going to get everyone's attention. And then I'm going to move on with the play. So I'm banging on this toaster oven, which only made it worse. Because now there's scary banging, like, coming in the dark so then i think okay that didn't work quick i have to do something i'm gonna go up to the front row of kids and just be like hey you know in the dark but just be like hey guys it's me remember me i'm the actress in this play and it's okay and you're okay i'm gonna do this i walked up to that front row of kids yeah. and they could sense my presence coming at them and they started to scream don't touch me don't you touch me <laughs> at me in the dark it was it was it was the most frightening theatrical experience of my life so wow. far i think but the play was actually really well received outside of this one school group who just like <laughs> lost their minds in the she dark didn't, didn't like the dark no Parents, parents and kids. The thing about this particular play was that it was really written with a Pixar approach in mind so that it would be enjoyable. How do you mean? How do you mean? Like, um, it didn't feel like children's theater. There wasn't any part of it that was like, hey, boys and girls, now we're going to have a play. I mean, it, it wasn't condescending. It you, you wasn't condescending. It wasn't even stylized like most um, children's theater pieces are. Um, it actually it starts with me coming in um, outside of the theater. Uh, into the little lobby area. There are all these boxes stacked up. And I'm talking on a cell phone. Uh, like, what do you mean the movers aren't going to get here? That's a problem. I need this roof, you know, I need the roof fix and blah, blah, blah. And I, I crash. I have a planner and keys and coffee mug and a, mm -hmm. a blazer and all the trappings of being an adult. And I, tr you know, crash into these huge pile of boxes, packing peanuts go everywhere. Um, and I enlist the kids to help me move all these boxes into my house. And then I'm like, okay, thanks for that. You can go. You can go now. Yeah. Like you move, you, you're my neighbors. You move those things in for me. That was cool. Now leave. So it like right from the, from the very first moment of the play, the kids are like, what, <laughs> what is going on? You know? Um, so it was sort of written and there's a lot of stuff in it for adults really too. Um, not like, not like sexual stuff or like complicated stuff. Like yeah, that, yeah. Nothing like that. But like the idea is that my character was going to, she inherited this house from her mean aunt Greta who just passed away. It was the house that she grew up in after her dad died. So there's a kind of a dark lining to it. And she, her plan is to come in and flip the house uh, and buy her dream house, which has granite countertops and a single car garage and all the things that adults are supposed to want to have. And over the course of the 70 minutes, she falls in love with the house mm -hmm. and sort of makes the realization that, um, a house is about the memories that you make in it and enjoying it. It's not necessarily about, you know, in sweet master baths and things like that mm -hmm. and decides to stay. But there's this whole sort of thread, you know, about flipping houses and blah, blah, blah. That's and about gentrification. And <laughs> she actually like says in, the, in an opening monologue, like, don't w I know this place is a mess, but don't worry. I'm going to fix it and I'm going to sell it. And then this house is going to make your neighborhood look so much nicer. So that's a win-win. Uh, and the kids, I mean, the kids are just staring at me blankly. Yeah. Parents are all nodding, smiling. Yeah. All the Philadelphia area parents are like, yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually didn't, stupidly enough, I didn't get it quite until I was actually in a room full of kids um, from a school, from an underprivileged school mm -hmm. who would like come with their underprivileged parents mm -hmm. Um as a part of a scholarship program and I'm up there like, and this house will make, it. Oh God, <laughs> this play is a little rough. They're like we've, we've, we've met you before lady. Yeah. We know you. Yeah. But it has a happy ending and the kids really loved it. Oh, There's good. a lot of good stuff in it. Do you know, besides children's theater, um, I definitely want to talk about bright invention yes. uh, because it's really interesting. And this is, I can, I can actually somewhat go tete a tete on this because I did a lot of improv too in college. Oh. Uh, I, uh, directed improv too. That's how I met my wife, actually. That and we were in a punk band together. But uh, let's let's take it back. So, Bright Invention is part is the resident. We're the resident ensemble. The resident I, I could the, the resident thing, the, the the resident ensemble company at White Pines Theater. Yes. 
which is outside the city, right? Just. It's um, in Elkins Park, which okay, is the first... Okay, that's not that far Yeah, out. no, it's yeah. the first suburb right north of Temple. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, actually, we're relatively new. We've, we're about a year and some change old. Um, the founding producer of White Pines, Ben Lloyd, approached me basically, uh, seemingly to me, out of the blue. I Did mean, you know him before? I kind of knew of him. We'd never really worked together. He'd heard of my, He'd seen my work. He'd heard of my reputation in town. Um, and he wanted to have a long-form improv company in residence at White Pines. And so he sent me a Facebook message saying, like, hey, do you want to get a cup of coffee? I have, I'm thinking about having a long-form company. And I thought that he just wanted to either pick my brain or enlist me to sort of be his uh like stage manager do yeah. all the paperwork and he yeah which i was not interested in and he was like no i you know i'd like you to run it figure it out figure out what it is cast it and figure it out so i got to have auditions and i um i've put together i think the 14 best actor improvisers in town and most of these people have tons of credentials of course um the whole equity thing doesn't matter in improv yeah. So I can, oh, because it's not scripted. Because it's not scripted. Oh, inter- that's an interesting. Yeah, loophole right it's there. a great loophole. So they can do whatever they can want. Do whatever they want, which means I can get a lot of actors involved that wouldn't otherwise necessarily be able to. And they to. might want to do something like that. Totally want to do something like that because it's flexible and mm-hmm. the t- there's a huge time commitment. And yeah, and we rehearse weekly. Sort of, I went, I put them through a really rigorous training process, and we rehearse weekly out in our space in, in Elkins Park. But we also do a lot of, um, we bring in master teachers and do master classes Mm -hmm. together as an ensemble. And I'm really interested in elevating the art form of improv. I knew I didn't want to do, just do more improv to do more improv. There's so much out there and it's all good. That's where I, it's it's funny. Um, This is, this is a slight recurring theme in the podcast where I, I wrestle with my very complicated relationship with, uh, with improv and theater Mm -hmm. in general, but Um, Because like I said, you're not the first actor I've had on and I'll kind of wrestle with how I feel, especially now that I'm older and I look back and I can kind of look at it with a little bit more clarity and uh, a lot of cringing. Yeah. Um, Um, A lot of improv is really bad. Yes, it is. It's it's terrible. It's terrible. Bob Odenkirk said, um, I'll paraphrase Bob Odenkirk. uh, He said like improv is a really great tool, but he's not particularly interested in watching it happen. And I agree with that a yeah. lot in the same way that I don't want to watch, necessarily want to watch a band rehearse. Right. I don't want to watch you write a song. Unless, it, it depends. I mean, there are certain artists who are truly great. You're just like, I want to see that guy write a shopping list. Like that's. Right, right. But for the most part, I don't, I don't want to watch you work on it. I don't want to, I don't want to stand up and clap because you got it right in a sea of getting it wrong. Right. I would like you to just not, I'd like you to maybe make some choices. Yeah. Yeah, and and to not say improv is not about choices. Improv is all about choices that you make right then. Um, I think college students are possibly the worst people to introduce improv to yeah. um, because the idea of ego and self is still in such flux uh, in a really really annoying way. Yep. Uh, I think high schoolers do all right in improv. I've seen improv with middle schoolers and like younger kids. That's super fun because they don't give a crap. They're just playing. They're just like, blah. Yeah. I yeah. get to say the things I don't get to say. But when you start to get an ego and shaping image and how you appear to people and all it's that. It's rough. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've, I've taught improv to high school students. Yeah. And, and in the right environment, it can actually be really awesome yeah. tool actually to help them let go of some of their ego and identity and all yeah. that. But yeah, no, I, I specifically cast in the ensemble actors actors not you know with, some of them have some improv experience most mm-hmm. of them didn't and i was and i did that very purposefully because the basic tenets of good improv is the basic tenets of good acting listening and responding truthfully to the given imaginary circumstances so i wanted good actors first because i could teach good actors to improvise really well um i couldn't teach an improviser to act in the amount of time that we yeah. we had on a professional level so these guys are all great actors who sort of get it. And then I just had to teach them the devices of improvisation, the sort of language and the specific tools of it. And we work in realism. So we so do... So it's s- not joke, joke, joke. No. In fact, it's, you know, it, it is often very funny because life is very yeah. funny. So truth, it has truth that... Truth and comedy. Truth Del, and comedy. Del Close. Yes, exactly. That yeah. has a truth and comedy. And I imagine you pull it. out the John Stone all over the place. Yeah, too. yeah. I and still have those books. I still read them every once in a while. I haven't done anything with acting or improv in years and years. But it's applicable to pretty much everything. everything. Yeah. yeah. One of my favorite improv sayings is how you do what you do is who you are. About like how how you go about things, sort of revealing who you are mm-hmm. at at a fundamental 
place. And so we create, it's my job as the artistic director of the company to create the forms that sort of house this improv. Um, one that you might be interested in, our most recent one that I just created is called Your Mixtape. Oh, cool. Yeah, it uses audience supplied song selections. So before the show starts, front of house will say, you have a song in your head, something you love, anything you like. Uh, you want to add, we put it on a randomized Spotify playlist. Oh, cool. And then you better hope no one says the Beatles. I know. I know that's happened a lot, actually. The and, Beatles, um, uh, uh, something that Spotify has the rights to. Yeah, right. Which is not the Beatles, but pretty much everything yeah. else. Um, and we put it on this randomized Spotify playlist. And then it, the actors don't aren't privy to that. Mm-hmm. They come up and the actors use those songs to inspire a collage of scenes and monologues that are based in realism. We do a storytelling opening, actually, about usually about music. Um, something about it, truth from working from personal truth. And we finish those stories at the end of the show. So there's sort of a bookend storytelling yeah. thing. And then we have a special device in that form where we fast forward and rewind scenes like a cassette tape yeah. can fast forward and rewind. There's They don't know when it's going to happen, but if they hear this particular sound cue, it means that the scene either needs to jump forward five years in time or rewind five years in time oh, from cool. the point of the scene. And sometimes I'll do like just to mess with them rewind rewind fast forward yeah so they have to create a sort of continuum or timeline in their head Mm -hmm. which is fun and you get to see characters really really grow like you get to see a couple um you know in a domestic scene um breaking up and then you get to rewind five years to their meeting um or five years before that before they even knew each other it's kind of cool the thing i like the best on the uh the description of bread invention was uh, your statement is like never wacky for the sake of being wacky. Yep. Which that is, you're going to talk about my, my wrestling with, with improv. Um, that has always been my thing is that I like jokes. And the biggest reason that people get into improv is usually for comedy. Like it's, it's usually comedy based in the beginning. Um, and whether you truly get into it later and discover that there's the truth in comedy and there's the human experience and that's what's funny. Um, but at the beginning, it's always just joke. Um, yeah, I mean, jokes are great, but they don't sustain. No. So when you're talking well, about... Well, I mean... I mean, they, they happen and they're they gone. Can't, they, so if you throw can, your yeah. scene under the bus for a, for a joke, joke... Yeah, yeah, and that happens all the all time the with young impro- and older improvisers, too. It's like, I want to be the funny guy. I want to say the funny thing and then have it be seen. And it's just like, no, you've just destroyed everything. And sometimes you'll walk over people and... Yeah, no, the, we don't allow for any of that in Bright Invention. In yeah. fact, with my beginning improvisers, when I teach improv, I actually encourage folks to... I tell them, this. you know, there's an idea that you have to be loud, fast, and funny to be good at improv. I'd like to ask you to be slow and boring to start. A- a- and it's really hard to actually be slow and boring. Mm-hmm. But it, it takes away that wacky for the sake of wacky element. And it forces you to dig deeper. Like, what else is there? What's the second choice? What's the third choice? Outside of just, here's the funny joke, or here's how I can say, you're not my grandma, and get a laugh. And then suddenly, (laughs) who are you? And now the whole scene has to be about whether or not you are or aren't my grandma. And you've put me in a terrible place as as your grandma, you know? (laughs) We actually... um, just finished this enormous maybe you read about this the improvathon but we actually did 24 different improvised formats and each hour in different yeah oh, something different cool. each hour yeah so we had you know sort of genre hours where we were doing um an uh, an hour of noir detective improv uh or rom-com or western mm-hmm. um sort of in the style of send-ups um we did, you know, forms that we've created together as a company. We did a drag hour <laughs> where we did like everything was gender bent and we threw the guys and dresses and the girls and mustaches, you know, just to keep every hour yeah. being different. And we had a bunch of special guests playing with us too, including like Brian Anthony Wilson of The Wire and Blanca oh, Ziska, who's who the was he again. He um he was he I had a record Yeah, yeah. He's um a really large African American guy. He was um, on the police force. I think he was like a sergeant or something. Yeah, yeah. He's a big guy. Big guy. Yeah, really big African-American guy. So he played in with us actually, you know, for a couple of hours, which was fun. And most of our special guests have never done improv before, but were artists of some kind. We're just like taking a big leap. It was it was actually, it was really cool. And uh, so that's the kind of stuff that Bright Invention aims to do. We don't want to just do more improv for the sake of doing more. We want to elevate the art form. We want to challenge ourselves creatively. 
be it you know sort of in an endurance challenge or um, utilizing different art forms. One one format that we've created is something called Click, where we use audience provided photographs. Um, and the photographic element as a jumping off point for our scenes and monologues. And so we're interested in how we interface with other artistic mediums to generate yeah. our work. Well, the music thing sounds really cool, too. I, I think you'd like that. I used to do warm ups like that, too, with people where I would just play. I would just sit there with my Oh, back then it was CDs. I had a little pile of CDs and I would just go in and pick stuff and make people. And I'd be like, we're going to do, you know, movement exercise or we're going to do. And it was all non it was all nonverbal. But like, you know, we're going to two person movement exercise to this music and then I'm going to change it. And you have to go with this yeah. while still being the thing that you were in the previous thing. That's awesome. And yeah. music is so visceral and for, for everybody, you know, for the audience too. people have really strong emotional memories and reactions to music and things like that. And so it's it was a really nice fit for us and it's high energy and it. Yeah. Do you find that people respond to you kind of subverting? No, I don't know if subverts the word, but you're definitely taking the traditional understanding of improv and just, I would say like turning out said, you're kind of just throwing that out the window and being like, well, this is what we're left with right here. We're going to show you where this comes from. Do you find like people respond to that in the same way that they respond to like, I don't know, like a more regular, like a comedy sports or like a who's line type thing? It's, it's really interesting. I, so I sort of do a couple things. One is I always try to frame out the experience for the audience in the curtain speech. And I let them know that we work in realism and just like real life, it's really funny sometimes, sometimes it's not, and that we aim to get the whole sort of gamut in there. And usually the first couple of scenes, I think the audience is pretty quiet. They're really engaged. It's this sort of actor's, storyteller's version mm -hmm. of, of improv. Um, by about three scenes in, you know, maybe 10 minutes into an hour and 15 minutes set, we, I can tell we absolutely have them hooked. And we do a thing where characters reoccur sometimes in that hour and 15 minutes in a time jump or in a new relationship. Once the audience starts to figure out the game mm -hmm. of it, they love it. And, and while it isn't maybe as rowdy as comedy sports, yeah. the audience is really responsive. They actually, I've had people tell me, I didn't think I liked improv until until I saw this and now I'm kind of changing my mind about well, that. Well, that could be that could be all part of my saga of wrestling with yeah. improv. Yeah, you have to come and see <laughs> us perform and, see and then it, see and what then you think. And decide whether I like it or not. Cuz I I often I mean we used to do st I've done stuff like that um rarely for an audience though. Mm -hmm. Gosh, we used to work I, I there were a few key guys uh in my troupe who and and a couple of girls too. I I, I use guys in the sure. general it means everyone but guys and girls and we would just workshop like in a you know like in a theater work you know like in a theater working room you know with the padded floors and the black boxes and things like that and we just workshop and it was never even really for an audience we were the audience if you weren't in the scene you were watching it right um and so but i often wonder with that this stuff that i, I don't want to call it like a higher higher minded or lower mind because i don't i don't want to value one thing above the other but it's different and I, I often think of it as like you've got bands out there that play who people are just like, well, only other musicians go to see that band because so I would, I'm curious with what you do do only other improvisers come to that? Do only other actors come to see that? Or do you get people just, we get just mostly people. normies. You get normies. We get mostly normies because we're out in Elkins park. Yeah. And so have you ever been to Elkins park? I'm, f I've probably driven through it. Probably. It's, um, really sweet actually sleepy little there's a co-op there's a huge um jewish community out mm -hmm. there um but there aren't a lot of like right there right there if you you know theatrical opportunities you'd have to probably go into the city mm -hmm. or the cheltenham arts center um so we get a lot of families and we get a lot of people that don't know what improv is but this is something that's literally in their neighborhood and something to do on a saturday night the thing is happening let's go to the thing. yeah the thing is happening exactly exactly and they really enjoy it which is really cool and when we perform when we pop up here in the city which we do from time to time then of course we get a lot of actors and there's a lot of buzz about what we're doing because um in the theatrical community you uh you get together to do a show the show lasts four weeks or six weeks or whatever that's mm -hmm. over and everyone sort of parts ways. This is an opportunity that I a really unique opportunity that I have to kind of invest in a group of artists over a, an open ended long term period. Um, one thing that we're thinking about that I'm we me myself and I am thinking about doing for for, for the new year is um, I'm really interested in these sort of experiments of like what would happen if and one of those experiments that I'm interested in is solo festival I'm interested on in how an ensemble does solo work okay 
I don't even really know what that means yet, except that I'm interested in exploring that idea. And so I think I might work with on, interested ensemble members to create solo it's like a pieces. Series, a series of one person shows. Yes, exactly. Would they with each, thematic thread. They perhaps. would each be improvised, obviously, because. Yeah, or, or partially improvised. Well, I mean, you, you would have your, I don't want to call them beats, but you would have, I mean, you would have your theme and yeah. you, and I mean, if, if you improvise, you're usually pretty good at dissecting a theme pretty darn quick. Right. Um, or you're going to dissect it in your own way pretty darn quick. You're right. going to be like, all right, if the theme is, you know, childhood, then you're just like, well, okay, boom, boom, boom. Like I've got three, I got three bullet points yeah right there and right. then you break off and then of course the key to improv is watching other people's bullet points feeding off it listening and responding saying yeah. yes and yeah yeah so <laughs> we might we might play with something for solo that's interesting yeah but we get to bring in you know different master teachers outside of the discipline of improv because i have this wacky idea that doing non-improv work together makes us better mm -hmm. improvisers and so what do you have for people out like you're talking not, not even just not improvisers but not even like not acting people right well who do you bring what what give me an example of that well i mean i'm looking for right now i'm looking for a sculptor to come in and like teach us to sculpt some stuff because i think that that's just because i think yeah. that's interesting and i think that would be a cool sort of almost residency thing for us to do together um we brought real life people in motion which is a dance movement company oh, okay. in um, and Broken Box Mime is going to come down from New York. There are mime troops. They're somewhat closely related to what we do. Yeah. But I'd be interested in, you know, musicians coming in, in puppeteers coming in. If, if you can dream it, you know, fire breathers or something. Yeah. Like, let's spend an afternoon learning to breathe fire together. What's that entail? Uh, probably breathing fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Probably danger. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of stuff. So we can kind of grow ourselves. Interesting. So it's not so much just like we're going to learn – we're going to learn the craft of improv together. We're going to learn the, uh, the craft of being people. People together. Being artists. Yep. Because you can't just be, you can't just be one thing. It, it seems to be the thing now. You just can't be one thing anymore. Right. Um, you know, an actor is also a writer. is also maybe a singer. And a writer might also direct or, yes. you know, or edit or something like that yeah yeah and i think that they all make you stronger oh definitely definitely know. but yeah I, I definitely think the days and technology or social whatever i just i think the days of being like oh he's just an actor or he's just a singer i think are long gone for the better too. too i think all those things make you better and it keeps people from being in camps too where you're just like i this is the music camp this is the acting camp this is the painting camp yeah right right yeah, and because we're interested in how different artistic disciplines interface with improv, you know, could we do improvisational painting? Yeah, probably. Oh, like we have figured that out. You know, you have what a whole little Burning like? Man, right? Exactly, there. exactly. We, I have, I am in this crazy unique opportunity that I have an incredibly talented ensemble, sort of ready to do whatever, a space, a little bit of budget, and no artistic mm -hmm. restrictions. Oh, from that's great. My boss. Just that's also the most positive I've ever been about Burning Man publicly. Ever. <laughs> I don't mean not. Nah, it's I, I have friends involved who have really who have really stated the case and on paper when they explain it to me, I'm like, that sounds fantastic. That sounds like everything humanity should be. And then the asshole part of me comes in and I'm just yeah. like, Fuck this hippie bullshit in the yep. woods. Yep, yep. Or the desert or whatever it is. In the desert. And that's from a guy who's like followed fish around. Like and I'm <laughs> the guy standing there being like, Ah, screw Burning me. Man's pretty hardcore. I thought oh, about gosh. I thought like my twenties were coming to a close and I was like, Oh shit, I haven't done Burning Man. Is that You feel like you gotta see it. There is part of me that just like I gotta see it. I'm like I don't know if I'd purchase because you know I have to be cool. I'm like I don't know if, I don't know if I get involved, but you know <laughs> right. maybe maybe I'll get maybe I'll write an article about. That's always things like maybe I'll write about it and then I'll just observe it from the outside. That's awesome. Um, you should do that. An yeah. outsider's view into Burning yeah. Man. Yeah, I don't think I. I feel like the whole community doesn't like the whole. From what I understand, Burning Man's about like that. They they would not abide someone just. I mean, they just staying just standing outside. Like you would have to get involved. I have no idea. Me and I and I, and I know people. I, I I should have someone on this show who can explain Burning Man uh, better to me uh, in a way. And I will try really really hard. <laughs> To not be a condescending asshole about it. But yeah, we pretty much have our own little. <laughs> but it is, man. yeah. It's a, it's an artistic experiment actually, with like a long term mm -hmm. collaboration. And it's ex and it's an experiment in a way that sounds like, from what you've told me, like has a finished product. Because like like yes. like I said in the beginning, but one of my biggest things with improv is that I don't want to watch you just. I, I don't want you. Oh, I don't want to watch you just riff. Right. I want 
I want to hear the song. Yes. That you got to after the riffing. Yes. So it sounds like you guys have you you put something together. Like there's a cohesive thing that is meant to be professional and not like, oh, if we get it, we get it. If we no. don't, it's weird. Yeah, no, we have really, <laughs> we yeah. have really weird, we have really high standards yeah, actually. Just like, of... This is going to be a thing where people are going to like walk away from this and be like, are you sure you didn't write that down? Because that's the biggest, yes. that's the biggest compliment you can give an improviser. It's just like, are you sure that wasn't written down? Yep. Yep. We get that a lot actually, which is really satisfying. Or people will come up to me after and say, thank you. And I'll say, oh yeah, you're welcome. And they say, no, 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 no. Thank you. Because something about the show really touched them, you know, like something really resonated deeply because we work in realism. And so, you know, life, death and family and parents and babies Mm -hmm. and holidays and all of that stuff, all that juicy, terrible, wonderful, beautiful stuff that you wouldn't think had anything to do with improv at all. Right. We we put it up there, you know, and we we try to be honest about it, honest in its comedy, honest in its drama, honest in its poignancy. And, I, and people really respond to well, that. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it it is honest. I think people, I think people know when they're being handed something that's not genuine or not, or that's contrived or that's like pieced together to get X reaction. I think people know that, and I think people don't like that. No matter you know, no matter how much what seems to be in the mainstream media seems to go, I think in general mm-hmm. people don't care for that. Yeah, I think um, people are really hungry for uh, sincerity and some level of honesty and, mm-hmm. and and you know the cool thing about improv is it's lack of adornment yeah. there isn't a set and there aren't costumes and there's nothing to sort of distract yeah. from the simplicity of the story and the, the thing is happening the thing is happening, and the thing is never going to happen like again. that again which is the yeah. great thing i like to you know about tibetan sand mandalas how In they will like no way do i know anything about that <laughs> you know you know about them <laughs> oh yeah well you know they, the monks get together and sometimes sometimes for a year sometimes for many 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 years um every single day for eight ten twelve hours a day they will place individual grains of colored sand in this in this humongous essentially they're making a painting mm-hmm. um with a grain colors, of sand at a, time. a gran, grain of sand at a time wow. and then on a and then it, and they're gorgeous and they're intricate and they're enormous and then on a special celebration day they take it to the river and they throw it in oh gosh yeah that's and something that's kind of the cool thing about improv is it's here and it's gone it's and you just destroy for it. you yeah yeah i mean well in the the act of creating it is also that's in the right. act of destroying it as well which is a whole that's a whole other podcast, with, which doesn't. Well, I mean, would that, but that doesn't. But that doesn't work. I mean, in with the the mainstream commercialism of all of no. all art, that doesn't work. It's like, what do you mean you can't get it again? What do you mean you didn't tape it? What do you mean that I can't watch it again? It's like, no, you can't, can't watch it again. It. Yeah, You're done. no, that's it. If you were here, you were here. Yep. It's like what I imagine. You know, like like jazz or. Yeah, like old jazz stuff like that that wasn't recorded. You just like, yeah, if you were there the day the guy played the thing like that. Then you can tell everyone. Remember the day you the guy the, played yeah, the thing like that. Yeah, um, and it becomes the stuff of of legend. It's really cool. <laughs> We're actually working on a little sort of house form where we can do this because the cool thing about improv is very flexible, mm-hmm. um, and we can do it in people's houses. Oh gosh, it's like a house show. Yeah, oh, we can wild. totally I, do a house show, and we I have never, done. I never would have thought. Wow, I never would have thought to do that, but it makes total sense. It's it's really intimate and wild and beautiful because you're in someone's personal space. You just go into someone's living room yeah. and just be like, "All right." You get to look around. We use objects. Um, in, we in the house. Yeah, to, oh, wow. to help inspire the form, and we look at photographs and books and you know whatever you have around. We sort of do a little detective-y, and then we create <laughs> a really awesome collage. You poke of around your poke life. Around. And then we make scenes about it. Yeah, actually. <laughs> and, and people really love it. It's really um, intimate in a different kind of way. Wow. I, I never, it's, that's blowing my mind. Yeah, that, that's blowing my mind right there. I never would have thought to put those two together. Because from a, from a music standpoint, it makes a ton of sense to do how, for that exa- exact reason. It's right. intimate and you're not, it's never going to be like that again. Right. Um, even if you were to come back the next night or a week later and do a show again, it would never be the same way again. Yep. Well, it sounds like. You've got a million and one ideas I know. kicking around, all flying around the room. Uh, and unlike a lot of people, you're actually stopping and pulling them down and being like, okay, well, what is that? Because th- that's one thing you, you've kept saying while you're talking. It's like, we're still trying to figure out what that is. Yeah. Whereas in most people, if what it is doesn't immediately present itself to them, 
it's like, oh, well, that sounds hard. We just, let's let's go find the thing where we already know what it is. But right. the, yeah. joy, the joy of acting, the joy of improv, the joy of all art and creativity is like, well, I don't know what that is yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm really intensely. I've reached this place now. I think in my 20s, I was like, I want to do plays. I want to do the thing that I know how to do and understand. And now I'm much more interested in what I don't understand. And the sort of real risk, we pay a lot of lip service, I mm-hmm. think, especially in the theatrical community about taking risks with our art and blah, blah. Oh, that's blah. great. Hey, have you seen, did, did you see Birdman? No. Okay. Yes. Okay. As, as, an act, as an actor, you definitely should see Birdman. Um, number one, it's just great to see Michael Keaton, like, just just knocking it out again. He's such a great actor. Uh, and everyone in that movie is great. Um, but there's a whole scene in there, and this doesn't really ruin anything, but this is a kind of a pivotal point in the movie where uh, he's getting in a, a theater critic's face mm-hmm. saying, like, well, what do you risk? I think the commercialization and commodification of all art denies risk and that we should be doing, basically what I'm saying is that we should be doing what you're doing, which is just being like, I don't know what this is, um, <laughs> but I probably won't die if it's not good. Right. Like physically, maybe right. emotionally. Emotionally die. a little. Um, embarrassment or whatever. But what? But even embarrassment, I think. I think as we get older, embarrassment is less of a thing. It's starting, yeah. Or you just your relationship to it changes. Yeah. Like it's still a thing, but I mean, like with this improvathon, people are like, so, so you know that your company they can do this, they can work for twenty four hours without stopping. No, no idea. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, we would not rehearsed any of. Two Everyone of the, could fall asleep in twelve hours, like, yeah. and it could be over. It could be the worst thing ever. <laughs> uh, all the special guests, you know, have you worked with them before? No, we've worked with none of them before. None of these people. We've never done any of these formats. We've never tried to improvise. Not only are we working Western. without a net, I'm pretty sure we don't have a wire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's kind of the cool thing about that. You it know, it is wild. Now I'm trying to think about like what other wild things you know i had i had a delirious thought at like hour 20 of the 24 hour improv <laughs> which is where all the good thoughts are happening yeah, uh, like uh bright invention does a 50 states tour 50 states in 50 days we do <laughs> 50 performances you know in it like get an rv oh god figure it out go across the country 50 states tour 50 i will days. say from a guy who traveled around in a band um that's something Right there. That's right? it's it's both something, yeah, and it's also something. I know. Oh gosh. Just the idea of fourteen, fifteen people all living on top of each other in R V for fifty days. <laughs> Although I mean I imagine with, you know, today's you know, with, with the internet and video and all that, you stream Instagram, tweet the crap out of it. Like yep. you could that could be a viral movement. It's wild. Isn't that cool? But it is. And those are the thoughts you've had when you've been improvising. For yeah. Hours. Well, because when I realized we were going to make it, my first thought was, oh, oh, my God, we're going to make it. And then what's, what's bigger next? Than 20, what's yeah. bigger than 24? I knew 50. we wouldn't be able to do, <laughs> stay up for 50 bigger. hours no. and improvise, but we could totally do 50 states. Oh, gosh. So that's maybe something to think about. Well, that's great. Thanks. Well, I hope you do it. Me too. I hope it's successful. I hope you have tons and tons of other ideas. And I'm looking forward to hearing what they are. Thanks, Dan. All right. You good? I'm good. All right. Rock and roll. We'll be together till the end of time. The 25th. Outstanding. Man, she's great. Such a great talk with Jennifer McMillan. Thank you once again to her for being on the show. She's not even here right now, and I'm thanking her. Um, that's how much I enjoyed sitting down and talking to Jennifer McMillan. Go to whitepinesproductions.org. Keep yourself up to date on all the stuff they're doing. Uh, it gives you also a link to the Bright Invention Improv Group, which Jennifer directs. It gives you schedules, directions, information, all kinds of stuff that you're going to want to know. Uh, you can check them out too uh, at whitepines123 on Twitter. They're on Facebook. They're all over the interwebs, and they're also on our Friends and Neighbors page at 25o'clockpod.com. Once again, got all the way to the end of the episode without talking about the website, 25o'clockpod.com. Hopefully, you didn't check out right when the interview ended. Hopefully, you're still with us. 25o'clockpod.com, old episodes, and uh, I write little blog posts about each episode as I put them out. They're not required reading, uh, per se, but uh, it's just my written perspective on the episode and usually what I'm thinking about when I'm putting the episode out. Uh, just another little little piece of the puzzle here at 25 o'clock. 
anyway, thank you all for hanging out. We're going to go out. Uh, like I've been doing the last uh, few weeks, I think I'm going to keep this up. I'm definitely going to keep this up. I've been going out on a piece of music from Philadelphia. Usually guys I know, sometimes guys who've been on the show. We did uh, a tune from Jack Diesel last week. The week before that, we did a tune from Nicholas Hughes. It was a great album called Miniature Galaxy. You should check that out. And this week, we're going to go out on a tune from a guy uh, who I've known since since early, early in my youth. Uh, the man's name is James Hearn. Uh, he and I used to play in bands together, and he's got some great solo material out right now. JamesHearn.Bandcamp.com. That's where you want to go to check out his music. And this is a song called Strange the Way um, from his forthcoming album, Yet to be Completed. James, you want to get on that, buddy. Anyway, you're going to love this tune, and you're going to want to get in touch with him and tell him to finish this record as well. James Hearn, Strange the Way, JamesHearn.Bandcamp.com. Thanks for listening. This is Dan Draker for 25 o'clock. We'll see you all in a couple weeks. Take care. Well, strange the way it seems. I changed horses in midstream. And it took a while to get back to my pace. Then the stream changed up with me. And love again Cause I did the right